the current status of Maine's deer herd and tools and strategies used to manage the deer herd in Maine. At the end, we'll be fielding some questions from the chat, so feel free to enter those throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll try to take as many as we can. Uh, this should be a lot of great information. So without further delay, I'm going to send it over to him. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you all for joining either for a first or second time. I'm going to try to put my presentation up here. And Lauren, if you could please let me know whether or not it's displaying the way we want it. So. Yes, looks good. Great. So tonight I've got a kind of wandering broad presentation about deer in Maine that's going to cover quite a lot of different topics, either in brief or in, in detail. And the presentation is going to really focus on four areas of interest. First, we're going to start way back in time and talk about a brief history of deer in Maine dating way back to pre-colonial times even. And then we're going to walk from pre-colonial times up until present day, where we'll talk about the current status of the white-tailed deer in Maine and our deer population as it is now. Then I'm going to provide a brief overview of deer management in Maine, which is going to focus mostly on the different tools that we have at our disposal for managing deer in Maine and when we use those different tools. And then we're going to wrap up by going over some of the management challenges that we face when managing deer in Maine. So for this first section, which I've entitled The Brief History of Deer in Maine, I will be drawing upon as primary source material a game division bulletin that was prepared for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Game at that time, back in 1963 by Don Stanton. And the game bulletin was entitled A History of the White-Tailed Deer in Maine. It's about 60 or 70 pages long with a lot of really interesting historical photographs and big type. And it's a really interesting read that I encourage anyone to check out if you're interested in deer or deer management or even just Maine history in general. And it's available for free online. You can get a PDF if you just search in your browser for a history of the white-tailed deer in Maine at uh, digitalmaine.com. It'll be the first thing that pops up. Or if you're watching on YouTube later on, you can pause and follow the URL that I have on the screen there. And it's really interesting the way they sort of researched this book. What they did is they looked back at a lot of old records from trapper logs and market hunting logs and explorer journals and very old newspaper clippings and tried to piece together as best they could what the history of deer was way back to pre-colonial times. So the, the game bulletin itself in this section of the presentation is going to be broken into five time periods. Pre-colonial times, which is going to be 1605 and prior, then the colonial period up until the point of Maine statehood from 1605 until 1820, then an era of logging and agricultural expansion from 1820 to 1880, then an era of conservation and protection from 1880 to 1920, followed by recent history, which at the time of the authoring of this game bulletin would have been 1920 up into the 1960s. Pre-colonial times 1605 and prior, Maine's landscape was quite a bit different than what it looks like today. The interior of the state was almost entirely mature forest at that time. There would have been some young growth and pockets of regenerating growth here and there where natural disturbances occurred, such as wind events or insect infestations or senescence of old trees or wildfires, things like that. And those sorts of disturbances would have opened up small pockets for regenerating growth to come up and there would have been locally better deer habitat in those isolated areas. But by and large, the best deer habitat during this time period would have been along the coast of Maine and along our inland waterways. These create openings and allow sunlight to get to the forest floor and the water's edge, which promotes young growth, which is much better deer habitat than mature forest. So by and large, across the state, deer would have been pretty uncommon during this time period, since mature, habit, mature forest habitats can support relatively few deer, and the higher deer numbers would have been primarily localized around the coast or inland waterways or in these areas of natural disturbance. In terms of human use is of deer as a resource during this time period, the indigenous peoples of Maine would have hunted deer for fur and for meat, but their impacts on the deer population were likely very low during this time period. Now the colonial period up until the point of Maine statehood, 1605 to 1820. During this time period, Mainers started moving away from the coast where they were mostly localized and started forging their way inland. 
And as they did so, they cleared land out for farming and they cleared land out and logged the land, cleared land for lumber, for infrastructure, for building homes, et cetera. And as they did that, that created opportunities for new growth to come up and edge habitat was created. And so these created local pockets of a more abundant deer than were found in the inland mature forest habitats. During this time period, we still had wolves in Maine as well. Uh, wolves are very effective predators on deer. And so in areas where wolves were locally abundant, they would have exercised some level of restriction on deer populations in those areas. Deer were relatively uncommon through the late 1800s still, but as farmers began to clear areas and loggers started to remove a lot of trees and promote young growth, they became locally more abundant. You did start to see during the tail end of this period, however, a lot of the farmers started to move west towards better farming grounds, towards Ohio and the like out there where farming was just a little bit easier than the rocky grounds of Maine. Now, an era of logging and agricultural expansion from 1820 to 1880, it was during this time period that ag really started to take off in Maine and start to spread a lot and spread inland. And timber harvest as well really started to expand quite a great deal. And as these practices expanded, they created good habitat for deer and created locally abundant deer populations. It was also during this time period that the wolf was extirpated from Maine. So in areas where wolves previously exercised some control over deer numbers and they were extirpated, deer were able to increase in number quite a bit quicker. However, market hunting also peaked during this time period. So this was when market hunters would, for a profession, go hunt deer and sell their, their hides and their meat at the market to make a living. And it was partly in response to this that we started to see a lot of our first game laws coming into, into being. And some of our first bag limits were put in place as well to start exercising some control over deer numbers and managing deer numbers rather than just letting uh, Maine residents take whatever they needed or wanted. Throughout a lot of Western and Northern Maine during this time period, deer were still pretty rare or absent. We started to see also late in this time period, our first records of some large scale die-offs of deer occurring in Maine. And it's not entirely sure, it's not entirely clear what prompted this series of die-offs to start occurring, most notably in the 1860s, but it's believed that as people were moving inland and clearing land for timber in particular, uh, while it would initially produce really good deer habitat and regenerating growth, as that regenerating young growth matured, it was no longer able to support as high of numbers of deer, and so you start to see die-offs and more cyclical deer populations as landscapes changed with changing land practices over the years. An era of conservation and protection follows this from 1880 to 1920. And there were a lot of changes during this time period to our main game laws and to law enforcement here in Maine. Our warden service in particular expanded quite a lot during this time period. So we went from a period where we had quite a lot of game laws, but little ability to enforce those laws to a period where we had game laws and we could actually enforce those. There were also a lot of changes in season dates and in bag limits and license fees during this time period and some other noteworthy legislation, including the end of market hunting and the end of using venison to feed lumbermen in lumber camps. During this time period, we started to see the agricultural boom kind of come to an end and ag started to decline once again. Timber industry started focusing more on pulpwood and more on long-term management. So rather than just going into an area and removing the trees, they were managing the trees for long-term um, wood products. And so you saw during this period, a lot of fluctuations then in deer numbers associated with uh, areas where the trees were being cut and regrowing, creating population booms for deer. And then as those trees start to mature again and were less able to support deer, you'd start to see populations decline. And we still see the cycle today in a lot of areas in Maine where deer become locally abundant when areas are cut over. And as they mature, they're not able to support as many deer. And so we see in a lot of areas, some cyclical populations of deer in Maine. Through the early part of this time period, deer were still pretty rare or absent in Northern Maine, but they start to become more abundant towards the early 1900s and were significant in, they were present in significant numbers by the 1920s. During this period, most of the Maine resident hunters and folks that wanted to travel into Maine to hunt, they were more interested in sort of the big woods hunting experience. So a lot of the hunting in Maine at that time period occurred in Northern Maine and the Western mountains. 
There were, however, growing numbers of deer in southern and central Maine, where we have most of our deer now. There just was not a lot of hunting pressure yet in those areas of the state. Now for recent history, 1920 till about 1960, when the Game Division Bulletin was written. Just before this period started, something very noteworthy occurred, and that was that the registration of deer began to be required in 1919. So this was sort of the start of us finally tracking the impacts of deer, of humans on deer and on, of hunting on deer, and getting a better handle on what we were removing from the population, moving more towards active management of deer as a resource. There were some exceptionally difficult winters as well during this time period in 1933-34. The winter in the north was particularly bad and northern deer populations saw quite a big decline uh, during those years. Also of interest during this time period, I find this very interesting. The area of the state that produced the most deer in terms of deer harvested per area was actually down east Maine, which is no longer the case today as most of our deer currently come from southern and central Maine. It's not entirely clear why this is, but it may have been partially due to land abandonment that occurred during the Depression era. People were leaving their farms, allowing those areas to revert then to young growth and providing good, good deer habitat and resulting in locally abundant deer populations. But this trend started to reverse once again after World War II as, as folks were returning from war and starting to settle those areas and hunt those areas once again. There was a lot of growth in our deer population from the 1950s up until the 60s. And that was only 60 years ago. And we have quite a lot of hunters still in Maine who are actually hunting during this time period and remember this time period still. Our peak deer harvests occurred in the 1950s and 60s where we had four years where the total deer harvest exceeded 40,000 animals. For reference today, we're typically harvesting around 30,000 animals per year. And then by the 1960s, we started to arrive at more of what we see today in terms of harvest, where most of our deer harvest is coming from central and southern Maine. And that brings us to the present day. So I'd like to spend the next little section of the presentation talking about the current status of deer in Maine. Now, Maine's, of course, very different moving north to south in the state. So I'm going to describe each area a little bit differently. It varies a lot in terms of habitat, where in the north you've got more mature woods and a much less fragmented landscape compared to central and southern Maine, where you've got a much more patchy landscape that's covered not just with forests, but also with agricultural lands and human development and road networks. There's also a lot of differences north to south in human and road densities. In coastal Maine, southern and central Maine, you've got most of the population centers for the state, most of the big highways and much higher road densities. As you move north, you've got much fewer population centers less highways, and especially in northwestern Maine, much fewer roads in general other than, say, logging roads. Also varying north to south are predator impacts, and we'll discuss that a little bit in the coming slides. As I said, I'll kind of cover north and south Maine differently, and we'll cover northern Maine first. In general, northern Maine deer populations are very low relative to central and southern Maine and either at or below desired levels. This includes northern Maine, western mountainous areas of Maine, as well as parts of down east Maine. In northern and western Maine, our deer populations are driven primarily by winter severity. During a severe winter, a deer is more likely to succumb to all different sorts of mortality. They're going to be more likely to succumb to starvation or malnutrition. They're going to be more likely to be taken by a predator, such as a coyote. And in some cases, they're even more likely to encounter cars on the road and suffer deer vehicle collisions. In terms of causes of mortality, we've had quite a lot of deer radio collared in northern Maine over the last seven years or so. And we found that in the more big woods type settings, such as our Wildlife Management District 1 and 5 study sites, coyote predation is the leading cause of mortality during the winter. And then the second leading cause kind of depends on whether or not you're in a more developed part of the north or a big woods part of the north. If you're more in the big woods, malnutrition and starvation are going to be your next leading cause of mortality. If you're, say, in Wildlife Management District 6 or parts of 3 where there's more roads and population centers, you're going to be more likely to have a deer being hit by cars. And we couldn't have a discussion about the North without talking about deer wintering habitat as well. Much of our deer wintering habitat has been lost over the last 50 or more years. 
This has been primarily due to major changes in the way that the landscape is used for timber and increasing efficiency in timber harvesting and pest, break, pest outbreaks have also contributed. Most notably in the 1980s, there was a large spruce budworm outbreak that decimated our northern softwoods cover areas. And that's kind of a two-pronged attack there too. Not only are the pests killing trees, but they're also severely compromising stands of trees such that it's much easier and more attractive to salvage cut those areas. Also deer feeding as a practice has become much more common over the last few decades in Northern Maine. So that's greatly changed the wintering deer dynamic for Northern Maine. We previously would have had deer mostly hanging out in these softwood stands for the winter. You now have deer either doing that or hanging out in towns right around people where they're being fed and where they have some refuge from predation within towns. And so it's a very complex dynamic with feeding and with natural deer wintering. And um, it's not fully understood yet how those two interact with one another. In our northern part of the state, deer populations are much slower to rebound as well after severe winters. You may have, such as we had in 2007 and 8 and 2008 or 9, back to back severe winters. And it may take five years or 10 years or 15 years or more for the deer population to truly rebound or it may never rebound depending on what's available for cover and other wintering strategies. There are, however, some parts of these areas that fare a bit better and tend to recover better after severe winters, such as the more agricultural parts of Northern Maine and some sections of down East Maine as well, where the climate tends to moderate a bit more along the coast. Now to Southern Maine. In Southern Maine, deer populations are much higher than Northern Maine or Western Maine or down East Maine, and they're either at or above desired levels in most areas. And it kind of depends what sex you're talking about when you're looking at what is controlling deer numbers. In terms of the buck population, buck population is mostly controlled by hunter harvest in these areas of the state, followed by deer, deer vehicle collisions. And then the doe population is driven more by deer vehicle collisions followed by a hunter harvest and coyote predation, where the influence of hunter harvest really depends on where exactly you are and whether or not you're in an area where we allow a lot of antlerless harvest to occur. In these areas, our deer populations will rebound very, very quickly. So either after severe winters or very high harvest year, it may be zero years or one years or perhaps two years for these areas to rebound to their previous population levels. Uh, very quick to recover in the face of adversity in these areas. And for these next few slides, I just wanted to highlight some things that I thought might be of interest, really in no particular order, just some interesting factoids, I suppose, about deer. And uh, this first slide shows a population estimate over time dating back to the mid 1980s, as well as our buck kill index trend. So population estimation is not a big part of the management we do. We do, a sex, we do look at sex age kill model population estimates each year for benchmarking and just kind of follow along with where we're at and answer questions and things like that. But by and large, we're not super concerned about the exact number of deer that we think we have. We're more concerned about the impacts of that number of deer. So rather than focusing on X number of deer, we want to know what the impacts of X number of deer is. We want to know about impacts on habitat. We want to know about deer human conflict levels. We want to do public survey and see what people's opinions are on the deer population and whether or not there's an appropriate level of deer on the landscape. Those are the things that we're more focused on with our management. So we tend not to look so much at population estimates with our management, but we do use the buck kill index quite a bit to track trends at least. And the buck kill index is just a measure of uh, bucks harvested per unit of area. So it's a uh, buck harvest density essentially. And you can see that the two track together quite well over time. So I think it's a pretty solid index for, for tracking population trend indicate, uh, for tracking population trends. But then we do have a few methods as well of, of estimating abundance and density for those um, folks who are interested in that. In terms of total harvest, We've got data back to 1919 when I mentioned the registration of deer was first required. Uh, you'll see I'm going to bring up a highlighter here if I'm able to do that on my screen. You'll see in these early years here, it looks like the harvest increases really fast over time. I think part of that was increasing harvest, but I think as well during the very early years of reporting, 
that reporting levels were probably pretty low, compliance levels were slowly increasing over time. So part of this is probably increasing harvest and a lot of it is probably just people slowly catching on to the fact that they have to register deer. Um, so I think you start getting your really good deer harvest estimates starting around the 40s or 50s up until present day. And as I mentioned in the 50s and 60s, you had our peak main deer harvests when the deer harvest eclipsed 40,000 animals total in the state of Maine. And then since that time period, you have a long series of ups and downs. Um, we're currently at a point where we're harvesting about 30,000 deer or so per year. So we're sort of on an upswing here, but if historical trends are indi any indication, we'll likely have more ups and, and more downs going into the future. Also, I think probably of interest to a lot of folks following on, along at home would be buck age structure in Maine. So on this figure here, I've grouped age structure in Maine by IFNW region. If you're not familiar with the regions, they are regions A through G, we call them. Region A would be far southern Maine. Region B would be sort of south central Maine. Region C would be the down east area. Region D would be the western mountains. Region E is kind of um, east central Maine or west central Maine rather. F is east central and and region G is about the northern third of the state approximately. So I've broken these all down into five age classes where the light blue bars are the percent of yearlings in the buck harvest. The orange bars are the percent of two-year-old bucks in the harvest, and then three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-plus-year-olds. To gather these data, we collect, we uh, systematically random sample uh, buck teeth from the deer harvest every year, and we try to collect a sample that's representative for each region. And we send those teeth off to a lab out west and they do cement manuli analysis of those teeth. And it takes them about a year to get the results and the deer ages back to us. So we don't actually have the results from the 2020 deer just yet. I'm expecting we'll get those in about September. So here we have the 2019 then um, results. If you look at the different regions across the state, you'll see in the higher deer hunting pressure areas in southern Maine, you tend to have a much younger age structure. We've got in regions A, B, C, and D, we've got approximately 35% of our bucks in the harvest are yearlings. There tend to be more two-year-olds than yearlings at about 40 to 45%. And then anywhere from about 15 down to 5% of three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-plus-year-olds. As you move farther north and deer hunting pressure decreases, you tend to have a more advanced age structure. So if you look at regions E or regions F, You've got more like 20% of the buck harvest is yearlings and stepping on down there through age classes. Interestingly, in region F in 2019, almost all five age classes were equally represented at about 20%, which is pretty interesting. Region G tends to fluctuate quite a bit more. The buck population there is not driven as much by hunting, but also a lot by winter severity. And so there tends to be quite a lot of fluctuations there, depending on whether or not a cohort really established or was hit hard by the winter. If you did have a deer age um, request or had a tooth pulled last year and you're wondering where and when that age will be available, as I mentioned, that'll probably be in September. And we post those deer age reports on our website. If you just search for IFNW deer age report, uh, the teeth from last year will be in the 2020 age report. In that report, I'll list all the deer ages by hunter last name, so you can look yourself up there. And then at the very end of that report, I'll also have some age structure figures for those interested in that. Not all teeth that are pulled will end up getting sent to the lab for aging. We only send a subsample of what's collected into the lab. And also some teeth might be broken or the wrong tooth might be pulled. So not all ages will be present on that age report. But if yours is, it'll be posted soon on our website if you just search for IFN, IFNW age report. And lastly, for this section, I thought rut timing might be of interest to our audience. These data were collected from roadkill samples that were collected from 2011 to 2017. And during this time period, we had staff members and when they would, um, when they would encounter a roadkill doe, they would perform a necropsy on that doe and look for fetuses within the body cavity of the doe and take measurements of those fetuses to estimate the date when the fawn was conceived. So in this figure here, we've got six or seven years of data. And on the horizontal x-axis, we have date during the year. 
And then the vertical y-axis are the number of deer that were found on the road that had fawns conceived on that given date. So this means that most or the most common date for a deer to have been conceived would have been November 22nd over this time period. And so this should be really viewed as kind of the peak of the rut and the peak of breeding activity when most fawns were conceived. So you see it's not just one peak day or one or two or three days when the peak of breeding occurs. It's more of a two-ish week period where, where breeding is at its peak, say from the late second week of November up until early December. Now for this next portion of the presentation, I want to talk more about deer management in Maine. Specifically, I'm interested in talking about different tools that we use to manage deer in Maine and at what scales and in what situations we'll use those different tools. So I'm not going to dig too deeply into things like how permit recommendations are arrived at or the nitty gritty details of all the different data we collect and what they're used for, and more about the different tools we have at our disposal in this particular presentation. So to start with, our goals and objectives for deer management in Maine are driven by a big game planning process. And this planning process takes place every 15 years or so. And the process involves public survey as well as public meetings. And we hold focus groups as well as online planning forums. And then we convene species subcommittees that consist of experts with the species and managing the species as well as some stakeholders. And we'll discuss the current status of the resource, all the data that we have available and what that tells us about the status and the trajectory of the population or the status of the resource. We'll also go over the public input that was received and we'll talk about the feasibility about different goals and objectives and whether or not certain things we may want to do in the upcoming 15 years or so are going to be reasonable as goals and objectives. And then the management approach that we use to meet these different goals and objectives is going to depend a lot on the scale of the management issue. So that's what I want to talk about next, the different approaches that we use and the different scales we use those approaches at. So first and foremost, most of our deer management in Maine by necessity occurs at a pretty broad scale. And here in Maine, we use the wildlife management districts. So we've got a map here of our wildlife management districts. There's 29 of them throughout the state. And they're large enough that we're able to collect enough data to support our decisions for the area, but they're small enough that we can encompass at least some of the regional variation that occurs across the state. So it's a del delicate balancing act there between being big enough to collect enough data there and small enough to account for regional variability. And there's always, there's always still gonna be a lot of variability even within these districts. Deer are a very patchily distributed resource, landscapes are very patchy, and you may have, even in some situations, one fellow might have quite a lot of deer walking past his tree stand every day when he hunts, and five miles down the road, you might not have another guy that doesn't see a deer all season. Deer are just distributed, not uniformly across the landscape, so there's always going to be variability in resource distribution across those districts, but we are able to account for some of the regional variability using these districts district uh, designations. And then the management that we do at the district level loosely follows what's called a, a bitey model, which is a very basic population model. It's kind of wildlife management 101 sort of thing, where you're basically looking at births, what you're adding to the population each year, deaths, what we're losing from the population. And then in some situations, you might also look at emigration and immigration, though those are less important at a statewide or, or a broad scale like district scale. So for here in Maine, the data that we collect on births would be our recruitment data. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to plug our citizen science project, the Deer Spy Project. Uh, this was a project that we started last year that seeks to collect observation data from Maine citizen scientists. And data collection started in August, August 1st, and it runs up through September this year. So anyone who's interested in watching deer and is willing to record the, what they're seeing in the field for deer and send those data into us, that'd be very much appreciated. Of particular interest to us are doe fawn groups. So we're able to witness on the landscape how many or what per, proportion of does have fawns with them and uh, what number of does don't have fawns with them. And then of the does that do have fawns with them, how many fawns do they on average have with them? And so that's a very useful source of recruitment data for us. If you want to participate in that, you can just go to our website and uh, go to the deer species page and look for the deer spy link, or you can just search in your browser for Maine deer spy 
And there's two options to submit data there, either online data submission or paper data submission. Historically, we've also relied on another data set that uses lactation rate data, as well as doe age structure and embryo rates data from our bio data collection that we do of hunter killed animals in the fall. And so these data basically look at using lactation rates, what proportion of does were weaning fawns toward the fall. And we look at yearlings versus older does there. And then also embryo rates. So not only what proportion of does were weaning fawns towards the fall, but on average, how many fawns were those does raising? So we have kind of these two different data sources that we're currently using for recruitment. Now our, our lactation rates data are much less reliable than some of our other data sources. So I'd like to get away from that and uh, air towards using more of the direct observations from deer spy in the future. So all the participation we can get in that project is very much appreciated. And then the other part of the equation is the deaths part of the equation, which is what, what are we losing from the population each year and what can we afford to lose further in the form of hunter harvest. So from the bio data that we collect each fall from hunter, hunter killed animals, we're able to get estimates of all cause annual mortality or what percent of bucks in total are we losing each year and what percent of does are we losing in total each year. And then by looking back at what we think we're adding to the population through our recruitment data, and looking at what we're losing each year, we can kind of look at whether or not there's headway there to, to allow hunters to harvest additional animals. And so these are kind of some of the things that we keep in mind as we're navigating the process of determining what level of harvest we want to apply to each of our districts, especially antlerless harvest each year. Now at the district level, the doe management or the manage that we, management that we do primarily revolves around regulating the doe harvest. While bucks are certainly important to keeping a population going, does are really the engine that, that moves the needle in terms of deer populations. So we're really focused on regulating doe numbers when we talk about management at the district level. And our management at the district level has since 1986 relied on the any deer permit as a management tool. Any deer permits are either sex permits and they're how we regulate the take of antlerless deer in Maine. In the figure here, you can see any deer permit allocations dating back to 1986 when the any deer permit system started. And you can see over the last couple of years, the number of any deer permits issued has really ballooned quite a lot. And we're gonna discuss this a little more in a later section of the presentation when we talk about management challenges. But what we're facing currently is especially in Southern and Central Maine, we're experiencing diminishing returns in a very big way on the permits that we issue such that where we could have previously issued perhaps five permits per doe harvested, we're now having to issue 10 or even 15 permits to take a single doe. And when the rest of your data sources suggest that the population is increasing, the inability then to harvest more does appears to be more tied to the permit system that we're using rather than the deer population. So we will be looking in the coming year at ways of adjusting the way we allocate antlerless harvest opportunity. And I will touch on that a little bit later in a later slide. Now getting away from the wildlife management district level, I'm gonna start stepping down in scale to smaller and smaller scale management options that we use. And one management tool that we use at a sub WMD level is the deer management subunit. And we've currently got two of these in Maine. One is in wildlife management district 25 and the others in district 26. And these were created uh, two years ago to increase antlerless harvest in localized areas with very high levels of deer-human conflict. So we track a lot of different uh, data sets for deer-human conflict. We look at deer vehicle collisions and property damage complaints and Lyme disease prevalence. And we use these things to look at all the different towns around the state and identify towns or clusters of towns that are consistently experiencing the highest levels of deer-human conflict around the state. And it's in those areas that we issue permits in a very localized way uh, bonus permits specifically that allow the take of an additional antlerless deer in an effort to reduce deer numbers in those areas with high levels of deer human conflict. The hope is that by reducing deer numbers in those areas, we'll be able to alleviate some of those conflict issues and decrease the levels of deer human conflict in the future. Stepping down from there to yet still a smaller scale to the town level, we sometimes work with towns to coordinate special hunts. Now, special hunts are pretty rare, but the situation where this occurs is when a town approaches us and documents that they have a major problem with deer in their town. And they have to as well demonstrate that there's very broad support for additional deer removal in the town to alleviate those deer problems. 
So this usually means that we have to get involved with the town council or whatever the town governing body is and do some sort of survey and hold public meetings to determine whether or not the support is there for extra deer removal. So it can't just be a landowner or two or a small group of people within a town that want to reduce deer numbers. It has to be something that the town very widely agrees upon and thinks that additional deer removal will help alleviate the problems that they're having. Now, the other kind of major hurdle to clear with this is that the special town is actually administered by the town rather than our department. So while we'll get involved with planning and consultation and providing input on the best way to move forward for the town, it's actually upon the town to administer the hunt. So the town has to decide what implements will be allowed for the hunt. They have to decide who's going to be allowed to participate in the hunt and where exactly the hunt is going to occur. And so if they want to be successful over a period of years, they need to have a pretty motivated group there who's really concerned about deer numbers and really wants to do something about it and is willing to see the special hunt through to completion over a year or a period of years. So while there are some hurdles to clear in putting on a special hunt, I think that that's a good thing and that it really makes sure that the town is very serious about the issue if we're going to go the route of pursuing a special hunt to reduce deer numbers and control some of those localized deer issues within towns. And then stepping down one more scale still to the parcel or the property level. Now our preference is always gonna be working with a private landowner on their parcel to use non-lethal methods of dealing with deer problems. So we're always gonna prefer that a landowner first try things like physical barriers or chemical barriers, chemical deterrence or hazing deer, things like this to alleviate the problems that they're having with deer on their property. But if we work with the landowner and pursue some of those things and the landowner demonstrates a good faith effort to control the problem using non-lethal methods and they're still not working, then we may look at issuing depredation permits for a particular property or a parcel a landowner. And a depredation permit allows that landowner to either on their own or through a designee uh, reduce the amount of deer on their property by removing a specific number of deer that is determined by our staff. So they can either remove those deer themselves or have a family member or a friend, or oftentimes they'll use an animal damage control agent to do the deer removal for them. And then one more management tool that I wanted to mention because I get quite a lot of questions about it. It doesn't necessarily deal with a particular landscape scale, but this is a tool that's used more to deal with specific situations, and that is expanded archery. Expanded archery is typically used in our more developed areas of the state. And in particular, we mostly designate expanded archery areas in areas where there are firearm discharge ordinances, such that either you cannot hunt with a firearm or you're limited in the type of firearm that you're, that you're allowed to uh, use in the area. There are some exceptions though, and where, um, We've just designated expanded archery due to other access challenges, most notably Wildlife Management District 29's expanded archery area. This would be our off coast islands area. And this whole area is designated as expanded archery just due to the very difficult nature of hunting on islands and the difficulty that we have getting hunters to actually travel to islands to hunt. Islands are notorious for deer numbers getting out of control and being very difficult to regulate with hunting due to access issues. So we try to use every management tool we have at our disposal for the islands. And that's why District 29 is expanded archery. But by and large, the rest of the expanded archery areas are around your town centers, your major town centers in Maine. And so these are areas that either have discharge ordinances or it's simply unsafe to hunt with a firearm. And now for the last section of the presentation, I wanna talk about some of the management challenges that we face here in Maine. Again, I've broken this section of the presentation up into North and South since the management challenges that we face across the state vary quite a bit by area. In Southern Maine, our primary issue that we're facing currently is under harvest of does using our current NE deer permit system. So in this figure here, I have the percent above or below our doe harvest objective we've been each year over the past decade or so. So as you can see, we've kind of on average been 15 to 20, as much as almost 40% below our set doe harvest objectives at the end of the season over the last decade or so. So we've been very chronically under harvesting does for quite a long time. And when we under harvest does, we try to compensate that 
for that in the following year by issuing more permits and trying to achieve a higher doe harvest the following year after an under harvest. But we've gotten to a point now where we've kind of plateaued in what we can achieve with any deer permits. And some of the areas around the state are really saturated with permits such that everyone who applies for a permit is getting one. We have a lot of permits left over still. So we've really sort of pushed the boundaries of our any deer permit system, a bonus permit system. And we're not really able to achieve a much higher doe harvest using that system currently. So while we are proceeding business as usual this year and had a very high permit allocation because of that, we are looking at revising this system for the future. And I expect that by next year, we'll have some pretty significant changes in place. We've begun this process of consulting with stakeholders and internally and reviewing what types of permits we use and the lottery as well. And we're going to be bringing some new ideas to the table and hopefully refining the way we allocate antlerless harvest opportunity in the next year or so, so that we can more precisely achieve the desired levels of doe harvest that we have. The other primary issue that we experience in Southern Maine is deer human conflict. We have much higher deer densities, much higher deer numbers in general in Southern and Central Maine. And so we have much higher deer human conflict levels as well. And we try to deal with that with depredation permits, with landowners who have properties, uh, individual properties that are experiencing deer issues. And then we also try to target some of those towns and clusters of towns that have consistently showed very high levels of deer human conflict. And we designate those, those areas as deer management subunits and we infuse those areas with additional bonus permits each year to try to reduce deer densities and lower levels of deer human conflict. And now to Northern Maine where our management challenges are very, very different than what they are in Southern and Central Maine. And they're more in line with too few deer than too many deer. So by and large deer numbers in Northern Maine and the Western mountains and parts of down East, is, down East Maine as well, um, deer numbers are lower than hunters would prefer. And um, a lot of hunters, as I mentioned, can, can remember still 50 or 60 years ago when deer numbers in these areas were much higher. And so there's an expectation that we try to steer deer populations back to where they were 50 and 60 years ago. However, the landscape in Maine is much different now. So that's a very tall task. There was this period in Maine after the extirpation of the wolf and before the coyote really arrived where our adult Maine deer were pretty much free from predation. And 50 or 60 years ago, when predators were not so much established in some of these areas, some hunters still remember that time period. And also during this time period, there would have been a lot better and more quality deer wintering habitat available. So deer would have had better opportunities to naturally weather the winter. Now deer wintering habitat is a big part of the issue that we face with Northern Maine, but managing DWA or deer wintering area cover is very tricky. Most of the DWA cover that we have is privately owned. So either um, conservation groups may own these and we can work with them, but more Commonly it's timber companies and, and um, timber industry companies that own the biggest pieces of land in the North. And so it can be difficult to work with these types of private landowners since they have um, different objectives in mind. They may be more focused on timber products and we may be more focused on deer and that's just a very hard thing to reconcile. We've also got a lot of our deer in Northern Maine now wintering in towns rather than in deer wintering cover. And that's a dynamic that's really changed quite a lot in the last 20 years or 30 years as deer feedings become more common in Northern Maine. And it's very interesting too, the interplay between these two dynamics. We have in some areas deer that may hang out in town for the winter where they receive some food and protection from predators as well. And that feeding area may be adjacent to good deer wintering habitat, uh, but the deer are using a town rather than deer wintering habitat. You may even have good deer wintering habitat that exists away from feeding operations. And it was historically good deer cover, but deer aren't using it. And so that becomes very difficult to justify protections on these areas and management of these areas for deer wintering cover when there's no recent use of deer in the areas. And then lastly, there's always the ever present um, specter of another pest outbreak like the spruce budworm outbreak in the eighties that could always happen. And I think in terms of historic trends were overdue for another outbreak of that sort. And another outbreak of that would, of that sort would result in a lot of loss of softwoods cover, both through the pest killing trees, as well as the salvage logging that comes afterwards. The tools that we have in place then to manage deer wintering habitat and protect some of these areas, we're 
We have zoning in some of the unorganized towns, which helps to an extent, primarily along riparian areas. And then we use a lot of cooperative agreements with private landowners as well. Uh, keyword being cooperative. And as private land as well, those are both key words. We're working with private landowners to come to some sort of agreement that works for both parties. And that's not always gonna be uh, exactly what we would want or the landowner would want. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's a tool that we've relied on the, a lot on the past. And it's a, a good opportunity to work with private landowners and do what we can to protect some of those deer wintering habitat areas. But then an, a new development as, as of this year, and this is kind of where I'll wrap up the slides before we jump into questions. Um, a bill was passed this year, LD404, related to deer wintering habitat. And this makes some changes that are going to be unique for our department. Uh, historically, our department has relied mostly on cooperative agreements and things like that to manage cover for deer. But through this bill, we're able now to prioritize projects using Land for Maine's Future Funds that are projects looking to protect and preserve deer wintering habitat. And also the deer management fund language has been ad uh, adapted a little bit. So where it was previously stipulated that the deer management fund could be used for deer habitat management, it may also, or it may now also be used for deer habitat acquisition. So we've got this kind of new tool at our disposal where previously we were more working cooperatively with landowners, but we'll now with the passage of this bill have the opportunity to actually acquire land as a department. And this will be state land that will manage for deer. And so this benefits not only wintering deer, but there are a lot of other species as well that like that mature softwoods cover. And uh, the land will be set aside and managed for deer, but it will benefit these species as well. And then these acquired areas will also serve as WMAs, since we needed another acronym in here, wildlife management areas. So these will be public areas for public recreation as well. So um, it's a very exciting time on this front where we're going to potentially be able to acquire some new areas in northern Maine and manage them for deer cover to the benefit of other species as well as public land users. And um, I'm very excited to see where that goes. It's probably going to be a very slow process. I don't expect that we'll be seeing big results in just a couple of years. A lot of deer wintering habitat that's been degraded over time may take a decade or more to really mature and develop into good habitat and for deer to begin using it again. So. It's going to be a slow road probably, but I'm very interested to see where it goes and I um, was excited to see, see that move forward and, and see where it goes from here. But with that, I think we've got probably around 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So I'm going to wrap up the presentation with these uh, final slides here and allow Lauren to jump in with some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was an awesome presentation. Hopefully people feel like they're walking away with a lot of great information. Um, so like you said, we've got a few minutes for some questions, some of which that have come in uh, definitely were touched on in your presentation, but it's always good to hear it a couple of times. And as we um, answer these questions, please feel free to continue typing those in if you're listening. So to start out, um, this was one of the more recent topics that you just discussed, but let's reiterate, why is it so important that we give out so many deer permits? So what's the importance of harvesting so many does? As I mentioned, harvesting does is basically the way we regulate our deer population. Harvesting bucks um, certainly helps. It does lower deer numbers, but in terms of the engine that drives deer numbers, it's our does. They're the ones raising fawns each year. And so harvesting does allows us to not only remove those does from the landscape, but also uh, lessen the recruitment that we see in the following year. And so we issue a lot of permits when we want to harvest a lot of does, but as of late, it has not been paying off the way we like. So as I mentioned, we'll be kind of revisiting the way we allocate antlerless harvest opportunity in the coming year, and hopefully arrive at a system that's better able to reach our, our doe management objectives than we are currently. Great, thank you. So outside of concerns for deer and human conflict, which you've mentioned a couple of times, with a high population, is there ever the concern of deer eating themselves out of home or can they cause adverse effects with vegetation when we see these populations get too high? Yeah, deer can certainly have a pretty profound impact on their habitat. We don't see it a whole lot in Maine, at least compared to a lot of other states. You may see in areas with locally very very high deer densities, um, such as islands, for example, where it's very difficult to control deer numbers. There you may especially start to see 
habitat degradation associated with deer. Um, at the district level, you're not typically going to have that kind of deer damage at that broad a scale. It's more going to be localized impacts and controlling those impacts is more going to be local or working with landowners rather than at the district level. And then also of note would be in deer wintering areas. You can definitely overstock deer wintering areas and really deplete the food resource in a deer wintering area. But uh, at the district level, we tend not to see very widespread habitat degradation yet. If you look at other states like New York and Pennsylvania, where they've got much higher deer densities, some of their forests have seen very profound impacts from deer. And it's not just loss of biomass, but also you see a lot of the preferred browse species really start to decrease in abundance. And then the less preferred species, which are often invasive species, start to become more common and take over um, in terms of the vegetation in the area. And then of course, any other species, small mammals, birds, or insects that rely on some of those species that deer are impacting may also become less abundant as deer are depleting uh, some of those preferred browse species. So very profound impacts associated with deer in areas where they're overabundant and degrading habitat. Great. So um, continuing on that cycle, uh, one of the most common questions probably we get is how impactful is the coyote population to the deer population and maybe touch on whether or not having that predator is important for helping us manage. It varies quite a bit north to south. As I mentioned in some of the previous slides, we tend to see uh, at least of our radio collared deer, a lot more of those deer lost to coyote predation in the northern part of the state, particularly in the big woods. While some of our sort of south central Maine deer have been taken by coyotes, it's been a relatively small number and deer vehicle collisions and hunter harvest have been more common causes of death for those deer. So it's worth noting also that most of our deer are in southern and central Maine. So where most of the deer are, the population is controlled primarily by things other than coyotes. In northern Maine, however, they do take quite a lot of deer, especially during the winter. Now I'm also talking mainly of grown deer, so grown fawns and adult deer. When we talk about neonate deer, little baby fawns in the spring, coyotes certainly take a lot of those, but so do foxes and black bears and even large predatory birds and fishers and things like that. So there's a lot of predators that will pay, prey on a newborn fawn as well. And so um, I don't think it was mentioned in the uh, presentation, but how is the department preventing chronic wasting disease from entering the state? Can you give a little background on what CWD is and why it's important that we're monitoring for that? CWD stands for chronic wasting disease. It's a, it's a disease of cervids. It's in the family of diseases called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And it's caused by a prion, which is a, a mutated and misfolded protein. And it aggregates in the brain of deer and causes lesions that cause them to lose neurological function. And eventually it kills a deer if, if something else doesn't kill it. It's always gonna be fatal if nothing else kills the deer. Uh, but it's, it's interesting in that it takes sometimes six to 12 months or even more for symptoms to really develop. And since it is a very transmissible disease, that means the deer will be infected for maybe a half a year or a year or even more than a year walking around the landscape, able to infect other animals before it really even shows symptoms. But uh, it's a disease that we don't have here in, here in Maine, thankfully. We don't have it in New Hampshire, don't have it in Vermont, don't have it in New, in New Brunswick. A couple of years ago, they did find CWD in a captive deer farm in Quebec, but they found no cases in the wild out there. So it looks like we have a bit of a buffer around Maine currently, and the nearest wild cases are currently in Pennsylvania, but we definitely don't want it here. Um, not a, not a good thing and not something I'm hoping to deal with in my career. In terms of stopping its spread into Maine though, one of the big things we're really looking to do is stop people from bringing in deer from other states where there may be CWD. So a couple of years ago, we put into a ban or we put a ban into effect on bringing full carcasses into Maine. So now if you're hunting in another state, I think other than New Hampshire and you bring a deer into the state of Maine, it's gotta be low risk materials. We can't have you bringing in full carcasses. So you can bring in boned out meat, you can bring in the hide or clean skull cap, antlers, teeth, things like that. Uh, but the idea there is to just really minimize the risk of someone say harvesting a deer in Pennsylvania in an area that has CWD and bringing it here home to Maine where they might butcher the animal and dispose of the carcass on the landscape where it could infect some of our wild deer. We really do not wanna see that happen. Good information. Okay, so we're gonna shift into some more hunting oriented questions. Um, 
Let's see, the first one we have, and I know you did mention this, someone uh, collected a tooth from my deer for aging last year. When will you be able to see that? Again, I know you mentioned it, but. Probably gonna be in September when we post those online. Again, there's not gonna be a 100% chance that your tooth will be on the list that we put up there. There's various reasons it might not have been sent to the lab or, or um, they may not have been able to successfully read the tooth, uh, but they should be posted in the month or two online. Great. And what does a bonus permit do? Um, where do you give them out and when can someone use them? Bonus permits are permits that we issue through the lottery. If we have more applicants or more permits rather in a district than we have applicants. So say we've only got 100 people that apply for a permit, but we got 200 permits to give out. Then those remainder permits will be um, sort of turned into bonus permits and again allocated via the lottery. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's sort of the gist of it. So if if you're filling out your application for an any deer permit, your lottery application, you're able to select three different districts where you're interested in getting an any deer permit. And you can also select two districts where you'd be interested in getting a bonus permit if that district has bonus permits available. And then if you win one of those permits, it lets you take an additional antlerless deer. So it's not an either or permit, it doesn't stop you from hunting on your regular license for a buck, it's an extra antlerless deer. And then uh, aside from that, we also issue bonus permits in our two deer management subunits, which again are in districts 25 and 26. So if you're filling out your application, you can select 25A or 26A as your preferred bonus permit districts if you're interested in, in hunting in those subunits with a bonus permit. Great, good information. So um, someone was wondering, is the lack of interest in hunting the biggest factor? And if that's the case, how do we promote hunting a little bit better? How do we get people more involved? I think that's certainly a big part of it. We've seen nationally trends in hunter numbers declining over the last quite a while now, decade or more. But this last year with, the, with COVID and a lot of people wanting to get outdoors was actually a bit different where we saw quite an increase in license sales, reversing the trend a little bit. So I'm very interested to see if that trend continues, but it's certainly a problem. We do rely on hunters to do the heavy lifting and do the deer management for us. We can tell people we need to remove this many deer. This is how you can do it, but it's you guys, you hunters that actually have to do the removal. We certainly couldn't have our small staff go out and remove 30 plus thousand deer ourselves. We have to rely on you. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do the question again? I actually forgot what the second part of it was. Yeah, no worry. Um, yeah, so how do we promote hunting more, oh, yeah, yeah. basically? <laughs> yeah, well, if you hunt currently, I mean, take someone out with you. That's always a good way to go. And um, hopefully with our sort of revamping of the system, we'll be able to maybe encourage some other different demographics to get out into the field a little bit more or cater to different demographics and encourage them to get out in the field and hunt a bit more. But it's tough. Culture has changed a lot in the last 50 years and, and the outdoors are maybe not quite as cool as they used to be to a lot of people. So really take people out if you can and um, just be a be a good role model in, in the sport and set a good example. Um, I know a lot of people, for example, like to maybe display their deer on the hood of their car or something like that. And it's perfectly legal to do that, but just maybe consider what impact that has on people who don't support hunting. It could be a turnoff to some people. Just Think of the example that you're setting as a hunter and try to portray the sport in as best as, as good a light as you can. So not only are you encouraging people to do it, but you're also showing that hunters aren't all bloodthirsty people. They're really mostly wildlife lovers and people who just love the outdoors and like spending time with family and friends out there. Yeah, I certainly think it's important to note that a lot of our hunters are looking for that um, opportunity to continue for generations to come. So they're conservationists in their own way. Um, so this next question really is starting to creep into uh, some of our other specialists uh, realms, but we'll give it a go. Will there ever be a spring hunting season for bear to reduce bear predation or spring trapping for coyote? <laughs> it's a loaded one for you. I got nothing to say on that one, honestly, not because I don't want to answer it, but I just don't feel very equipped. I have given it zero thought. <laughs> so I would yeah, defer those, those are... to our bear specialist, Jen, or, or um, for coyotes, maybe our fur bear biologist, Chevenel. Yes, and those those types of questions are definitely asked during other presentations and YouTube videos. So if you haven't tuned into those, those might answer some of those questions as well. Um, that's primarily what I've got. Um, there is one last question. Um, We'll see if, if, 
if I can say it right. So how long will it be that a less than four point buck can be shot per year to allow the bucks to grow and be a lot more buck doe ratio one to one? I think that person's talking antler point restrictions is what I'm, I'm guessing. I believe so. I don't think antler point restrictions is a management tool or, any, or something we're likely to get into as an agency or support as an agency, given current population trends. In the states where they've used antler point restrictions, you typically have a much different situation where you've got a very, very lopsided buck harvest towards yearlings, where maybe 70 or even 80 percent of your year of your buck harvest is, is yearling bucks. Here in Maine, I think we have a very healthy age structure. In most areas, we've got 35, 40, or 45. I think the average statewide is about 42 percent of our buck harvest is yearlings. And then it tends to be closer to 45 percent or so or two-year-olds and then less three, four and five-year-olds. But I think in terms of age structure, we have a pretty healthy age structure in Maine. There's no question that hunting older bucks is much more difficult than yearling bucks. They're much stupider than your old bucks. So they're much easier to hunt and it's harder to even see older bucks, but they are out there. And when we randomly sample teeth, we see that every year. There's a lot of older bucks out there that's just a lot harder to hunt them. Now we have done public survey too on antler point restrictions. And um, regionally, antler point restrictions uh, tended to be more supported in down east Maine and northern Maine. In these areas, I think antler point restrictions are probably the least appropriate compared to anywhere else in the state. Typically, if you're going to have an antler point restriction in an area, you want it to be an area where there's abundant opportunity to offset some of that uh, buck pressure onto antlerless deer. So if, if you're in an area that doesn't have much antlerless harvest, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to restrict what hunters can take in terms of bucks since uh, entirely, since all of the hunting effort rather will be on bucks. So yeah, in like Northern Maine where it's pretty much buck only hunting, an antler point restriction would just put 100% of the hunting pressure onto the older bucks, which it just doesn't really work very well for an antler point restriction. If you're in an area though, where there's a lot more opportunity to take does, it might work a little bit better as a management tool. But in terms of what we're seeing for a deer population, there's not really a biological reason for us to pursue it right now. It would be more of a social issue. And social issues are certainly important. And it's good for people to weigh in on those things and voice their opinions. But in terms of pursuing something from like the biological angle, uh, as a biologist putting forward different proposals for regulations and things, there's not really a reason right now why I would do that uh, for Maine, given what we're seeing with our deer population. Great. Well, I think we've pretty much covered all those questions. If there's any that we miss, we'll certainly attempt to answer them later on. You can always feel free to email us. Um, but thank you very much, Nathan, for doing this presentation and uh, giving people an idea of really how we monitor and manage this uh, very important species to the state of Maine. And um, if you have any final words, please feel free to say so. And otherwise, yep. until next time. I would like to emphasize, as I mentioned previously in the presentation, we are reevaluating the way we allocate antlerless harvest opportunity over the coming year. And so that may mean some pretty significant changes for next year. And change is always difficult and hard to keep up with. So I strongly encourage anyone who hunts or is interested in hunting to be on top of that and really read through new regulations and be, pay, be paying attention to the news um, before next hunting season to make sure that you're caught up on any changes that we put in place and are in compliance with those uh, different things that we might be putting in place. And again, participate in Deer Spy if you see deer. I greatly appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you everyone again for joining. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and feel like you're walking away with some good information. And again, please feel free to reach out uh, to our INE team. If you have any further questions, we'd be happy to try to answer anything that you guys ask. So thank you everyone.